All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next EDW session uh, called Build an Information Architecture for AI with IBM Cloud Pack for Data, which will be presented by Emma, is it Hind? And I'm, I'm sorry, Michael Hind and Emma Tucker, I'm sorry. Uh, Michael is Distinguished Research Leader for IBM, and Emma is AI Governance Leader, IBM Cloud and Cognitive Software for IBM as well. Um, all audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right of the screen, and our speaker will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you, and welcome our speakers, Michael and Emma. Let's give them some claps. Thanks, John, thanks. Uh, so I'm Michael Hind, and I live in IBM Research, and we're gonna talk to you about some of the things that IBM's doing around AI governance. Uh, if you were here earlier in the day, uh, we had a session with uh, RBC, uh, where we talked about AI governance in, in general, the general topic, and now we get to focus a little more on what IBM is doing here. I'll turn it over to you, Emma. Thanks, and I'm Emma Tucker, and uh, I've been working with Mike, so he's uh, looking at this AI governance from an IBM research point of view, methodologies, understanding what open source technologies we can build as well. Uh, and then I've been working on how do we build tools to support AI governance and make sure that you're successful. And so today we'll get a sneak peek into both sides of what each of our teams have been building in this space. So. I wanted to set us up a little bit with the IBM perspective around AI governance and trusted AI. So we view the larger initiative as trusted AI. How do you trust the data you use and the AI that you build using that data? And so it kind of has three components. So uh, understanding ethics and how you should build out your AI strategy. And all of that would be surrounded by tooling and the technology that you use. And that's kind of where my personal focus is. And then also around making sure you have an o ecosystem, an uh, open source ecosystem, diverse ecosystem of tools that you are using in order to accomplish governance. And so moving into the next one. And so at IBM, we kind of view this trusted AI as having three different parts of it. There's first, or not first, it's kind of no order really, but trust in data. So that's, we've been talking a lot about data strategy, data governance uh, here, but then also trust in AI models. How do you make sure that the models that you build using that data are trustworthy? that they're not biased, that they're meeting your business goals that you've set out for it. And then also trust in the processes that you have built around it and the workflows that you have and the life cycle that you have around AI models. And so uh, Mike, you can take it away from here and talk a little bit about what we've built. So we've been uh, working on um, four distinct uh, areas and there's actually other areas as well, but the the ones that are, are most visible right now are these open source initiatives in the first three columns. So the, the first one is looking at the issue of fairness or bias in AI. There's been a lot in the press, um, uh, good and bad, uh, about various uh, companies that have had issues with bias in their AI systems. Uh, and so what we did is we took what the scientific community has done in this space, ways of detecting bias uh, and also potentially mitigating bias, and we put it together in a common framework, a common open source toolkit, which is a bunch of uh, Python code or R code um, that will be able to measure bias and then have a bunch of options for mitigating bias. Uh, this is open source, this is bleeding edge. It is um, a way for practitioners to give feedback to researchers and also for researchers to feed out uh, cutting edge technologies that are publishing in, in top conferences and practitioners can try them out. We spent a lot of time on uh, documentation and examples, uh, because we know that this is not necessarily accessible to everyone. And so we wanna make sure that we can sort of bring these two communities of researchers and practitioners uh, together. Um, this complements nicely IBM's product in this space called OpenScale, which is an uh, industry sorry, enterprise ready uh, platform that allows you to monitor for bias and also explainability. This one here is more of a you know, cutting edge, bleeding edge sort of sandbox where people can, can play with ideas uh, and a, a, large, a larger collection and diverse techniques. Um, and it has a, 
a Slack channel, an, uh, a Slack channel that will uh, allow people to collaborate and ask questions and learn. So even if you don't want to play with the code, you might want to join up on the Slack channel. Right now, there's almost a thousand people that are on that Slack channel communicating, answering questions, and so on. Uh, the second pillar is explainability, which I, I mentioned a second ago, uh, and that's looking at the problem of you know how can you find out if what your why your AI model is making a decision and get some insight. Um, and if you think about that problem, it, it's a very hard problem because explaining for humans is actually hard. It depends on who you're talking to. And so in that toolkit, we also have a, a bunch of different explain, uh, explainability techniques um, that have different strengths and weaknesses. And again, uh, same kind of thing with lots of documentation, tutorials, uh, and, and so on. Um, the next one is looking at the problem of, of robustness. This is a scenario where uh, an adversary is trying to uh, sort of trick your model or understand things about your model, understand maybe where the decision boundaries are. Um, and there's been a, you know, there's a whole research community working in the space of trying to defend from these attacks. And so once again, this toolkit is bringing these all together in the same place. Uh, it's very, very popular. And you can see there's lots of notebooks and examples and, and so on. And then the last pillar is, is what we're gonna focus on uh, in this session. Um, which is this idea of uh, fact sheets, right? This is looking at the space of transparency, which is very much related to, to governance. Um, this is not an open source uh, toolbox yet. It's, a, it's a, um, a website with a lot of information. I'll walk you through that. And it's gonna feed exactly into our product. And Emma will show you sort of the beginning of that in, in the last five minutes of the session. So if you just bear with me for a second, I'll just wanna go to the, um, the website. So you can, of course, view this yourself. Um, if you just search for Fact Sheets 360, this website will come up. Um, so, so what is it? There's a lot of information here, and, and the first thing I should answer is, you know, what is a fact sheet? What are we talking about? Um, and if, the way to think about it is a fact sheet is it's a way of getting transparency for your model development process, right? So, let's say for example, uh, you just acquired a new company, and that new company has an AI model, and you're trying to figure out, you know, how good is this model? Uh, you know, what was it trained on? Uh, did we did we detect bias? What's the, um, the the accuracy of it? All kinds of information you might want to ask. It would be nice to have some kind of document or some collection of information that tells you uh, the answers those kinds of questions, right? So a fact sheet is basically that kind of information. And just to give make it a little more concrete, over here we have various examples of real models um, that are all publicly available, uh, and you can click on one uh, and get an idea for the kind of information. Okay, so no, oh, take a little while to load here. Okay, there we go. So um, you know, at a high level, you can see there are these different categories, uh, all different things you might be interested in, uh, and then you can see on the on the right, you know, this goes on for a while. A very detailed piece of information about the model. This is particularly relevant in industries that have a validation requirement, like in financial industries where they'll have a separate role, a model validator, that's trying to look at uh, these kinds of issues because they really want to control risk and mitigate risk. Um, and so this is an example of, of that. But before I go into other examples, I just wanted to uh, touch on a few topics. Um, so the first, is, um, you know, am I saying a fact sheet is sort of a bunch of questions and then you answer that and you're done? Um, or is it something else? Um, and the answer is it's it's more general than that. It's it's you know often we make an analogy to something like a nutritional label, um, where in your mind you say, okay, I get it. That's the most important information that it about. In, in this case, packaged foods. In our case, it would be a, an AI model. Um, but what's implied there is some kind of standard. Um, and we feel right now that there's there's not going to be sort of one standard that's going to fit all uses. Uh, in some cases, you'll care about, let's say, bias. In other cases, you may not. In some cases, you, you almost always care about accuracy, but the way you measure accuracy may vary from situation to situation. Um, so our view of a fact sheet is this sort of malleable uh, idea of it's the information that your consumers, whoever they might want to be, want to see, right? Um, so that consumer could be a regulator. Maybe you have to convince them that you're doing things well and you're, you're mitigating risk. Or maybe it's actually one of your customers who wants to see how your model was trained because they're concerned about something. Or maybe it's a model developer on your team that is now looking at reusing a model 
and they're not sure exactly if it's safe to reuse this model. So they want to know some information about that. Each of those use cases may have a, a slightly different view on what facts are important. So we, we feel that a fact sheet can, can deal with all of those, um, but you want to tailor it to those particular use cases. And that raises the next question. So, okay, so if a fact sheet is this sort of general mechanism, how do I go about you know, building one? I don't have these set of questions, these magic set of questions I should answer. What do I do? And that gets to this section here called methodology. And it's basically a methodology for creating a fact sheet. It's a, an idea that basically says, um, here's a process that we think you should go through with the appropriate stakeholders to understand, uh, to get to a point where you're, you're actually producing that some, something that someone wants, right? So uh, if you're familiar with user-centric design, it's basically using that idea, right? So the first step is to understand who your consumers, why are you building this fact sheet, who actually wants it, um, and what do they want? You know, what does the regulator want? You know, talk to the regulator, find out exactly what they want. And then understand, well, okay, that's great. Maybe some information that they want, you can't produce. It just, it's not possible. Maybe it's going to be giving away too many, uh, too many uh, IP secrets. Um, so there's this, this tension between producing information that your consumer wants and also understanding, you know, what can be produced. And then the methodology goes on, and there's actually a paper that talks about it further where you're creating you know, a template. Template is basically the set of questions tailored to a use. You go and fill it out and use a lot of uh, you know, iteration here. Um, so there's more detail. There's some dimensions you may want to think about in, in uh, understanding which of these so-called facts, which of these atomic information about a model you want to record. And you can look at this you know, at your leisure um, in terms of methodology. The second thing I want to mention is is governance, and this is the thing that's uh, you know quite interesting, and we hear from many many customers a real sincere inter interest uh, in this space, uh, and that's the ability to control and and related to that understand what's happening as you build models. You know, so there's a nice little video. I think it's th three minutes here that explains uh, what we're about, what we're productizing, um, but I'll just go through this uh, briefly over here. Um, so here's a typical life cycle where you've got a business owner, a data scientist, a model validator, and an ops person, right? So your life cycle may differ. You may have more roles, but this is kind of the basics, right? Someone requests an AI model, a data scientist goes and creates it. Um, she sends that to a model validator who does uh, testing and QA, looking at risks. And then if all goes well, things get deployed. Unfortunately, in practice, there's a lot of iteration going backwards. But that's kind of a, you know, a very simple life cycle. And what we see is that the, each of these personas actually have interesting information about the model development and deployment process. Even the business owner who's not building the model, they're requesting the model. They have some really useful information that can be uh, used by, uh, by consumers of this model, such as what was the purpose of this model? Uh, what's the risk level to the enterprise of this model? Uh, and so on. And so our view is you would collect this information from each of these personas, even you know runtime information, what happened, and collect that in some central place. And then you can actually um, serve that up in various ways to various stakeholders. So if you noticed, you know, above we had four stakeholders, and down here we actually have six people consuming. And that's to signify there are other people outside the life cycle who might be interested in this, such as a chief risk officer or a regulator or even a customer. And to make this concrete, uh, let me just go through an example. Uh, we'll go down to here. Right, uh, sorry, this one right here. Um, this is just a snippet of a, of a fact sheet. Right? And what it shows here is sort of four different dimensions, four different ways of measuring goodness about uh, the model. You know, so one of them is performance, and we have four different ways of doing that. Uh, another is about fairness or bias. Another is about robustness. Another is about explainability. And what you see in these columns is for that same model, basically different data sets that are testing the model on these dimensions. And you see these values, and it doesn't matter what the values mean. Um, but what's happening is as you move to the right, going from the data set, the test data set from the data scientist to the one the validator used to the actual live traffic, you see things change. Um, and in this case, they don't change too much, but the idea is you'd be able to track this and see if our processes are working well. Is, you know, generally what a data scientist is trying to do is test the model in a thorough way that would be predictive of the model's power when it actually gets deployed. 
And if you see those values kind of matching up, then you say, okay, I think we've got a process that seems to be working, at least working well right now. Uh, and this could be something you track over time. Okay, um, just give me a second here. So there's a lot more information and also links down here to you know IBM uh, offerings in this page. There'll be more coming in the upcoming months. Um, and I just wanna point out uh, in the examples, there's one over here that's a mortgage evaluated uh, one with a governance slant, right? Um, so the idea here is this, this fact sheet was actually created um, automatically by a, a research prototype um, to basically collect these facts. Um, and you can see there's many, 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 many things. Uh, it's that, you know, that abstraction I showed you before with the people, um, but here you actually can see uh, the details uh, coming out and you can see this, some of them were collected with our, our product uh, open scale. And then lastly, before I turn it over to Emma, um, this website also contains a lot of other information you know, links to papers, uh, news coverage, and is also over 24 hours. If you're having trouble sleeping, <laughs> you can see a, a lot of videos that came from, from IBM research on this topic of transparency and governance, just overviews on of, of AI uh, in general, trusted AI in general, things about fairness, explainability, uh, and so on. And then finally on the right here, uh, there's links to these those toolboxes I mentioned earlier in case you didn't copy down the URLs you can get there pretty easily. So I will uh, stop it over to Emma to talk you through um, some of the, some of the uh, things we'll be seeing in the product. Great, thank you, Mike. All right, I'm gonna show you how we've envisioned this becoming part of the product of Cloud Pack for Data. So Cloud Pack for Data is our platform for data and AI, and includes a lot of different applications within it, depending on your use case. And so uh, we imagine that it's, especially if you're a financial services company and you have to follow SR 11.7 and set something up around model risk management where your model validators are kind of a separate organization, or perhaps you're already doing that anyway because you want to have this validating group from the data scientists who build your AI models, uh, then you might start with this kind of model entry saying, okay, we want to build this model. Uh, data scientists will take it and then we'll go through the validation process. And so right now you're looking at uh, a, an offering called Open Pages in Cloud Pack for Data. And this is what we use for the AI lifecycle management of being able to understand exactly what step we are at in the process and be able to capture metrics along the way. And so as part of that, we might have started a review. So you can see we have this initial validation process that we've already started. And so a model validator would then want to go into, uh, and Mike had mentioned it, watch an open scale our uh, offering for capturing a lot of these metrics automatically um, and being able to monitor AI models in order to evaluate an uh, AI model before it goes into production. So in this case, we're looking at this German Chris re credit risk model uh, in pre-production. And so OpenScale will capture a lot of those metrics that you saw Mike share that came on the fact sheet. Now we believe that a, a fact sheet is more than just explainability of each transaction, but showing these metrics that you capture uh, in a single evaluation and over time, as well as who does what is all kind of part of this fact sheet in view of what your AI model is doing. And so in OpenScale, we're able to see the key metrics that we captured automatically. And this is taking advantage of a couple of those open source tools that Mike had shared uh, in order to capture fairness and explainability um, and even to help de-bias different algorithms. And so I'd be able to dive into one to better understand, you know, this is really low. What, what's going on, how many counts of um, risk or no risk have we seen? Uh, and then I can even go back and I would be able to uh, compare this to a challenger model because you need to make sure that you are putting your best foot forward and that there aren't any other AI models that could be doing a better job. Um, so this does look like our pre-pod model AI model might be doing better, but it really depends on your organization's standards, um, 
if this even meets the bar, this is below threshold. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't approve it uh, at this point. But it, it also depends on your business KPIs and the specific ones that are critical for your organization. And that's also the most important part is making sure you choose the right KPIs and metrics to follow for your AI model. Um, otherwise, you might be introducing something that you're not quite aware of or maybe hurting in ways that you didn't expect it to happen. Um, and so the fact sheet is a way in order to capture what's important and all of these automatic metrics that we can do in OpenScale. Um, but from here, a model validator might approve, and that would mean that you would update the process within open pages and move it at one point back into production. And so once an uh, AI model is in production, it's best to be able to continue to monitor it over time and be able to capture all of these metrics and see what might have changed. So you can see the threshold went below, uh, it, or the fairness metric actually went far below the threshold that we have set. So we'd be able to get alerted um, and do a review sooner rather than later and be able to actually click on details to understand exactly what might have happened at that moment and the different outcomes that we got. Um, you can go into each evaluation if it makes sense. But then also, I, we showed you a document that IBM Research had kind of come up with. And you can produce a similar report here within OpenScale. And it's really important that you be able to have kind of something that you can keep in hand because this will show over time. So you can create a report maybe on a regular basis and be able to see historically how things are changed. And I do have it here, uh, but also, Oftentimes, organizations will have a regular committee meeting where you review the AI models um, on some kind of regular cadence, whether it be every quarter, every six months, depending on the classification and impact of the AI model, and make sure that it's still meeting your business goals, uh, that it isn't showing uh, or, or below threshold in the bias or whatever it is that's really important to your organization. And so you would be able to share this report beforehand with everybody so that you have a chance to review before, understand the training data and the features that are used, as well as all these metrics that we've captured. And you would be able to then use the dashboard to dive in and even get explainability uh, at, of each transaction of the model. Uh, because this is what we traditionally think of when we think of explainability, what was the outcome of every single transaction. But we're, we're challenging our customers to say that explainability is so much broader than that. It's about the entire AI lifecycle. What's the purpose? What data assets did you use? What metrics have you captured over time right now? What are your thresholds? What's important to you? Um, and all the information like that. And so that's what we have today in Cloud Pack for Data in order to catch the, capture this fact sheet view of all your AI models. And so I'll switch it back now. Um, looks like we have about five minutes left and we can go to questions. While we're waiting, Amber, I was wondering if you could talk about how this relates to data governance. Yeah, I and I've come from the data governance portfolio and I'm working on now what we do around AI models and we're actually trying to use a similar motto. We say know your data, trust your data, use your data when it comes to data governance. And so you in order to get to the AI model, it's really expanding on that. And oftentimes we even see um, maybe some organizations will start out with having a CDO and some head of data science but as you mature, you bring that together and the CDO starts to own the data science pieces as well. And so that's where data and AI governance are kind of two pieces in the same pod and that it, you have to have data governance in order to say that you're governing your AI models because you need to be able to trust the data that was used, that was high enough quality, that it wasn't biased, what was used, be able to show that it followed the proper data privacy rules as well. Um, that you understood it, it was the right data asset. 
uh, but then also be able to expand your policies. So just how we have policies that we need to write up around how to use data assets in the organization also have similar policies uh, and glossary in order to put context around your AI models. Right. And I think one of the challenges, and I wonder if you can comment on this, is that um, when you're talking about policies, you're, you're in, in governance, you need to have something, I guess, concrete. Um, and this probably gets into the, the glossary because, um, you know, I could think a policy might be um, I should not uh, use data in any bad uh, use cases. <laughs> I could write that yeah. down, um, but it might be hard to implement. Maybe you can talk a little about that. Yeah, and that's where we're, so you, you might see it in, similarly in data governance. And so you can explain and be descriptive with your policies, but then we also have ways in Cloud Pack for Data for automating those policies, for anonymizing data and following data privacy. And so we're researching ways that we can do similar policy automation with AI models and what that actually looks like on that type of asset within Cloud Pack for Data. Um, but it's really, that's where having an AI ethics board within your organization and setting up a clear AI strategy is where you'll kind of nail out some of those details um, and regulations that are coming up. There was a EU released their proposal for their AI regulation today. So if you want to go research that, we'll have a post about it um, on our site, but also you know, feel free to go and research it because it clearly defines some use cases that you can't use AI for. Great, great. All right, um, thank you, Emma, and thank you, Michael, for this great presentation. Uh, it does not look like we have any questions for you, um, but if the audience does have any other questions later, I recommend that they find you on your speaker pages and you can continue networking from there. Uh, all right, thanks everyone and have a great day. Thank Bye. you all. Bye-bye.